every Sunday to 5,000 people and he never had a microphone. <laughs> uh, also, he knew the names of the people. Uh, every one of them, he knew his congregation. So, we'll get along if you can hear me. Uh, I'll do it the best I can until my throat gives out and then it's time to go home. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> I've selected some wonderful hymns for today and uh, if you'll open your bulletin, the first thing you'll see is this little folder inside. I folded it for you once, but you'll have to fold it the second time. You see where that is? You say, what's that for? Don't ask so many questions. <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> now, the first song we're going to sing is number 748, but it's not the tune. Erickson's going to play something else like he was doing today. I have no <laughs> idea what he was playing over here today. All I could think of, he must have had a fight with Dee Dee. <laughs> <laughs> but it was magnificent. Thank you, Erickson. Hey, Amen. That was awesome. And they never fight. Incidentally, they never fight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I am his and he is mine to the tune of 797. You will know it. And we have the violins here today. Clifford, uh, Clifford's are here, Patrick and, and uh, Nathan, and we're going to have a good time. So uh, this may come back on, on its own. We have no idea what it might do. All right, number 
She is a non clapper but if you're going to be clapping, you will take this and you will put it on the pew in front of you so you can see the words. This is why I get the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now you can see it. Now, some of you have heard this before. We tried it once before, and it was wonderful. It was really wonderful. And so it's been a while since we've done it. But it's a, a bouncing melody, but it's great theology uh, around Easter time. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. And it's a marvelous, marvelous testimony mm -hmm. of the whole gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who even though we don't have sound here, he hears, he listens. And I'm so thankful for the fact that everything we do here uh, is to bring him the glory and the honor. All right, so Erickson... Uh, I don't know. Should we try to do the? You want to try the first stanza like this with the music so you know it, or will you catch it? What should we do now? I think we got it. You think we got it? Yeah. All right. So here we go. <laughs>
So this next hymn that uh, is set to this tune of Nicaea has been a favorite throughout the church for years and years and years. And it's from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Not a choo-choo train. These, his robes filled the temple, and smoke was there, and angels were there. And they covered the, their faces and their, their hands and their feet. And, and they cried out to the Trinity, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So we're going to sing this song, but we're going to do it in the way that we've done in the past. We'll sing it softly for us. That'll be no problem. We'll sing it softly. We'll build up each stanza until we get to that third stanza. And then if you like, you can stand, if you can stand. And we'll sing to the great glory of God and the organ will be a full organ, the violins will be a full violins playing all the strings <laughs> and, and, and you will be singing too. So think now of what you're singing about this great God. You're now singing to the Lord. So this is our prayer to you. Here we go.
I will praise you, Lord, with my whole heart in the assembly, for your righteousness is marvelous, and awesome is your name. You are gracious and full of compassion like no other. Your loving kindness it endures forever. Your works give pleasure to all who study them. For who has done anything more honorable, more glorious, more wonderful to be remembered in all the world? Therefore your works and the truths of your word, they stand fast. For in them you show yourself holy, a savior with no rival, a redeemer of your people, and faithful to generations of those who call upon your name. We thank you, Father, that you have given yourself and your son, Jesus, to be our portion and our inheritance. You have drawn the lines of our lot in pleasant places. You have made our cup to overflow with your favor. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have given us counsel by your word. You've not left us to our own devices, but instructed us by it, that we will not be blown about by each new wind of teaching. We rejoice that we have hope in you, Lord Jesus Christ, even when all around us seems to be falling apart. We know that you will not leave our souls in Sheol, you were not allowed to seek from tr corruption of death, but you conquered the grave with life eternal. How much more can we ask you for all things? Thank you. So we now confess our sins in light of this great grace. We admit that we've put other gods before you. We've taken your kindness for granted, and our sorrows have multiplied. In many ways, we've gone astray and not trusted the warnings of your word, and now we need your guidance to return us home. Our thoughts have dwelt on vanities, and our desires have chased after empty treasures. We have slandered and deceived others. We've grumbled and complained, been arrogant and loveless. Father, forgive us for Jesus' sake. Cleanse us with his blood. Holy Spirit, renew a right spirit within us and fill us with your grace. Intercede with us for us now as we offer these petitions. Lord, you have been favorable to this land and your people. You have forgiven our sins in the past. Help us to turn again. Revive us that your people may rejoice in your mercy. Let your mercies come to your people who humble themselves before you, that we may have an answer to those who speak reproaches against us and your word, that this nation will once again walk with the liberty of your law. Grant courage to the ministers of your gospel, both here and around the globe, that they would speak your testimonies before kings without any shame, that you would break through the gates of hell with your strength, Holy Spirit. Be a comfort to those who are experiencing affliction. Draw near to them with your bright presence. Bring to mind the sweet songs of victorious pilgrimage in their ears. For our church, we ask that you would supply our needs and keep us faithful to the gospel. Bless the reading and hearing and preaching of your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now that time of the service where we want to greet one another and we ask that if you see someone you may not recognize that you would greet them in the name of Jesus. Please stand and, mm -hmm. and greet each other.
we, we will, but in lieu of that, we have a box that, that is stationed right there in the back for you to place your offerings. And we thank you for all those who have supported us through the, the dry months of summer. And for those online wanting to, to give uh, that way, there's a button that you can push there to, to donate now, um, right, right there. And now uh, let's, uh, let's receive a, a wonderful musical offering in lieu of, of the offering. that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you teach us more about his lovely name? Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being here today. Um, I don't know what is wrong with all of this, but at any rate, the subject is a wonderful subject. It's the subject of heaven. We're going to talk a little bit about heaven. And it, as it happened, uh, 
There had been an accident. The husband and wife were both taken to the hospital. He succumbed to his injuries. And they are standing up in heaven. He's there first. And he's in a big long line. The line said, all those who were heavy pecked by their wives stand in this line. So there he was. Well, in a few hours, his wife succumbed. And then suddenly people noticed that he was changing lines to the line of the non pecked There was a shorter line. And so the fellow turned and said, oh, you were in that line. Why did you get in this line? He said, my wife told me to. <laughs> so what was the thing? <laughs> to have wives who care about us and help us make decisions and all that good stuff. Uh, <laughs> heaven's a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. Mm. And everybody has their own ideas and thoughts about it. As a minister, when I have memorial services, funeral services, celebrations of life, we don't try to talk about death, we talk about life. But I'm always amazed at what some people think. And, and some people <coughs> say, oh, I know there's an angel up in heaven. You know you're not going to be an angel when you get to heaven. The Bible doesn't tell us that. And to get in, your name has to be written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's, it's referred to as the Lamb's Book of Life one time in Scripture this place called heaven. Eight other times it's referred to as the book of life. And when we're born in this world, our names are not in that book. <coughs> it only comes from redemption. Once we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord, then our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. When the apostles came and they said, oh, it's a wonderful thing. You sent us out to preach and we preached and we have wonderful results. There was a great revival and people were we're coming to know God and confessing their sin. And Jesus said, don't boast about that. That's not the important thing. What's the most important thing? He said, boast about this, that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. And the pen was dipped in the blood. That was the ink, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our names are written in that book, <clears throat> the Lamb's book of life. And when you get to heaven and you knock at the door, as Pilgrim and Hopeful did, I talked about that last week, Pilgrim and Hopeful, they arrived there and they said, let us in. They said, where's your certificate? You have to have a certificate. And you will say, my name is in the book. My name is in the book. So we want to talk a little bit about heaven and, and what a, a glorious place it is. Um, I, there was a lady named Teresa. She was a young girl in her mid-20s and she found the most perfect man in the world, Vincent. She and Vincent, they thought, oh, this is great. And finally, after dating for a while, he even went to church with her. But sadly, when it came down to marriage, uh, she found out something. She went to her mother. She said, Mother, I cannot marry Vincent. Why not? She said, he doesn't believe in hell. He doesn't believe in hell. Now, what would the mother say? Well, the mother said, Darling, you go ahead and marry him. And between the both of us, You'll soon be leaving hell. <laughs> oh, if you tell that anywhere, don't say where you heard it. <laughs> well, when we come down to heaven, here's what we're we're so wonderful that He invites us to heaven. There are several times in the Bible that I I love the word that Jesus issues and that God issues and through the prophets. It's the word come. You're invited. In John 21 verses 1 and 2, he says, come on, come, eat breakfast. And Jesus wants to be with us and he wants us with him. In John 1, it says, come see. Come and see. You know, those are the first recorded words of Jesus in the Bible. In John's gospel, he had been baptized by John the Baptist. Actually, he was a Presbyterian. <laughs> but he was baptized and so there uh, the next day there's a big crowd there listening to John preach he's preaching about to get into heaven repent and he looks down there John the Baptist he looks down there and he sees this crowd and he spots Jesus his cousin and he says behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and so two of his disciples John and Andrew uh, they follow him and they left John the Baptist to go follow Jesus. And Jesus is walking along. Have you ever had this experience? 
when you are somewhere and you know somebody's looking at you, <laughs> and you turn around and sure enough, they were looking at you. Well, Jesus is walking down the pathway and he knows they're behind him. So he turns around at them and then they just sort of pretend they're doing something else. <laughs> And the first recorded words of Jesus are the same ones year after year, day after day, servant after servant. What are you looking for? Those are the words of Jesus. What seek ye? And they said, we are looking for Jesus. We want to know about you. And he said, come. And they went with him. And they spent all afternoon with him. They, he explained to them at an elementary level, like the shorter catechism, not the longer catechism, the shorter catechism, the basics of who he was and what he had come into the world to do, to be the Savior, the Messiah, to fulfill the role that was spoken about so many times in the Old Testament prophets. He came to fulfill it. And they were thrilled. They were excited. They became almost Pentecostal. And they went out, and of course, the first thing Andrew did was he got Peter. Peter, come and see this man. We listen to him. You've got to come and hear what he has to say. So there are these invitations. Come and see. Matthew chapter 11, he says, come and learn. Learn. That means when you come in, you, there's information that's going to be helpful to you. You're going to learn about things. What will you learn about? Well, you learn about yourself. You think you know you, but you don't. Only God knows you. You learn about the world that he made. You know, it's interesting to me to think that we're talking about heaven. None of us know exactly where it is. We're talking about a place that we're going to go, but we don't know where it is. And that's what the apostle said. Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And so we know that the way to heaven is through Jesus. So wherever he is, there's heaven. But in this universe, three things were created. Time, matter, space. But that means that God can't be in these. He can come into these, but he's not trapped inside. It's not pantheism. There is a limit to space because he created space. It's just like this pulpit. You see this pulpit is here, but I'm not in the pulpit. I'm using the pulpit, but I'm out of the pulpit as well as in it. And so if God is, is transcendent outside of it, as well as eminent in it, then where is heaven? It means that God is outside of time, matter, and space. There's a, there's a place somewhere that's beyond space. We'll talk about that in just a second. And, and so he said, come learn. Come learn about these things. He's not trapped in time, matter, and space. Incidentally, they all had to come into existence at the same time. It had to happen all together. Matter had to be, but where would you put it? You have to have a place to put matter. So you have to have space, you have to have time. They all have to happen at the same time, and God does it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we have this knowledge that we have. Now we don't get drunk on knowledge, because the more we learn, the more we, the more humble we should become. Another thing that I love about heaven is you know, Jesus used these words with his disciples. He says, come and rest a while. Now, he's not talking about the eternal rest. He's talking about come and rest a while. Um, you need a vacation. Years ago, I bought stock in a company called Twisty Treat. It was an ice cream company. It's a penny stock. And they're their buildings were all shaped like an ice cream cone. There's a couple of them around in Orlando. If you go to Orlando, you'll see the Twisted Tree ice cream cone. Well, I bought stock in that. I was a sucker. Because <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it started doing real good, the people who got the big salaries, they, they sold the stock. They sold it to a group called I Need a Vacation. I thought, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> And they paid for a vacation with my money. So those things happen. But you do, you need a vacation. You need to get away from it all. They call me up every once in a while. They say, if you're trapped in your timeshare, we can get you out of it. I don't know. Are you? Do you have timeshares that you're trapped into? You want to get out of it? Um, 
we're not trapped into a timeshare. We have the best timeshare in the world. And if you want one, I'll tell you where it is. It's right up the road, 114 miles, a little town called Sebastian. And you can get a week, a week every year is your week for about $400. Well, then what happens? Well, there's an HOA, of course. You have to, you know, you have to furnish things, and that's about four hundred dollars a year. In Florida, you can't go anywhere for four hundred dollars a week. But what if you don't want it? You walk away, and they'll take it back. So you need a vacation. You need to rest. And every rest and vacation that you take on Earth and explore and find something new is only a little tiny sample of what heaven would be like when we are exploring this universe and whatever else is beyond this universe. There'll be travel lists to sign up for. There'll be a group going over to examine this star or this planet in the solar system or out of the solar system. Heaven's not a place of, of sleepy rest. You know what? I will not tell you this because you'll all want to go. There are no sermons in heaven. Do you know there are no sermons? Do you know that you won't have faith in heaven? The faith that you have here, you need. It's the means whereby you lay hold on all that God has for you, but you won't need it in heaven because you will see, you will know. Jesus said, come and rest. You need a place where you can rest. The children of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt. And they were always a type for us to see. They were slaves in Egypt. Then they came out into the 40 years of the wilderness. But they never really could rest. You know, God has a sense of humor. The way they knew when to move was by the cloud over the tabernacle. They built a tabernacle out of tents. It wasn't a cheap thing. In today's money, it'd be worth about six to ten million dollars. Mm. Goat skins, silver sockets, boards overlaid with gold. Mm. All the boards were lined up like the fingers on the hand. This is the way they did it, so that they could carry it. Each person carried a board. All the priests they had they had hooks on the outside. And they would run a gold stave through them, and that kept the board together. You know that symbol is used in the epistles when the apostle Paul says. You are a building, fitly framed, like the boards, and joined together. <clears throat> but the, the, the Lord God Almighty, he didn't always stay in one place. He was moving. And on one occasion, they would all carry everything, and then the cloud would settle, and they'd say, bring in the board for A goes next to B, B next to C, C next to Who's got the stage? Put the stage through. Aaron and his sons, you've got this to do. And all of these people had all these, the Kohathites, they all carried these things together. The furniture of the Ark of the Covenant was put in place. Everything was put into place. Mm -hmm. And in some places it stayed for six months. But do you know on one occasion, the Lord our God who plays tricks on his people because he loves them and has a sense of humor and he humbles them, the cloud settled and they set everything up. They went to all that trouble. And the next day the cloud lifted. And I think for some people could say, why did he do that? Doesn't he know how hard it is for us? Do you ever say that? Why did he do that? Just when you think you've got God all figured out? Why did he do that? And then again in Matthew's gospel, he says, come and dine. And I love that song. I sing it all the time. Jesus has a table spread. It's not an altar. There's no sacrifice here. If you want to think of it as a spiritual sacrifice that you are giving yourself to him as he gives himself to you in the bread and wine, that's good. That's what. That's a good meaning. But there's no, no bloody sacrifice. That's at Calvary. And the idea that a priest stands up every day and makes a sacrifice offering up the blood of body of Christ to God to appease him and that Hebrew says it like this every priest stands daily to no effect the book of Hebrews it's all done once and for all how beautiful it is that we have this once and for all and what do we do here it's the kitchen table Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed he invites his chosen people come and die 
Come and dine. Like you know what happens when you have a meal with friends, fellowship together, you get to know them. You enjoy their company. You find out things about them. Mm. You share experience. That's what Jesus says, I want to be that for you. Now here in this world, it's limited because of time, space, matter. But in the world to come, it's not limited. The next thing he says is Isaiah. What an invitation. Come now, says the Lord. And let us reason together. And though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be white as snow. Come now, let us reason together. The Hebrew word there is haggle. Come now, let's haggle it together. The sins that you love and cling to, God says, they're nothing. Let them go. Why? Because what is promised to you is even so much greater and better. Well, I tell this story so often about Sam Morriston, the missionary to Africa. He'd labored a whole lifetime in Africa. He came home, he was sick. He was on the ship called the USS United States years ago. And on that same ship was Teddy Roosevelt. He had been to Africa too. He had been to the game reserve and he had been hunting for a couple of weeks. He, he was having a great time there. He was a great outdoorsman. And so Teddy was on that ship and when the, the ship pulled into the dock in New York City, there, <clears throat> the band was playing to welcome the president home. The banners were flying. They were all flying up there. Welcome home, President Trump. Oh, I mean, President <laughs> welcome, wel welcome home, President Trump. <laughs> they had all the banners flying. And Marston looked and he said, Lord God, the president has been in Africa two weeks shooting and killing game to put on the wall. And I've been there a lifetime. And there's no one to meet me. Feeling sorry for himself, the Lord tapped him on the shoulder and said, Samuel, you're not home yet. Amen. You're not home. So when things don't always work out the way you want them to, remember, you're not home. All right, so now let me just sum this up and just say, well, where is heaven? And I can tell you very frankly that whenever our Lord speaks about heaven, he always speaks of it as up. Now, well, what about the Chinese? Don't worry about the Chinese. Wherever they are, it's beyond. It's up. It's away from. Look, the Lord says, Lord, I look up to you, up to heaven, where you rule. So heaven is somewhere beyond us. And Jesus, the Bible tells us, when he fed the 5,000, he took two loaves of bread, two fish, and he looked down at his feet. No, he <laughs> looked down at his feet. He looked up. Mm -hmm. When you pray, we bow our heads and close our eyes in order to, to keep us from distraction. That works when you're young, but when you're my age and you bow your head and close your eyes, you're sleeping. <laughs> but he, our Lord Jesus, he, he, he took the tube and he looked up. He always looks up. So where's heaven? It's beyond. It's beyond. Is it a place? Yes, because he said, I go and prepare a place. You know, all this just sounds too good to be true. The age-old question, every culture every race, every religion, every, whatever they are, they all ask the same thing that Job asked in Job 14, 14. If a man die, will he live again? The age old question is, will a man live again? The scripture read in your hearing today tells you on the authority of God's word, not only that he will live again, but that there is an afterlife with two places of departure. One is bliss and the other is dreadful. It, you know, uh, John Calvin, the great reformer, thought that this might not be a parable. He thought this might be a real story. Also, Luke 15, when Jesus speaks about the prodigal son, he says, a certain man. So most parables, you don't say a certain man. You give an illustration. But in this case, it's the only parable, if it is a parable, that Jesus tells who he names the, the name of the man. Lazarus. Lazarus. And, you know, Lazarus is the Hebrew word, Eleazar. He was the first priest. 
Eleazar. You know what it means? God helped me. So here's this man. In all of the living of his life, he never got a good break. He's poor. He's sick. As a matter of fact, the fact that the dogs came and licked his sores, Jesus tells us just so you would see, this is nauseating. This man is, you couldn't get any more despicable than this man. But this man had something that the rich man couldn't have, didn't have, and didn't want. And incidentally, the rich man didn't go to hell because he was rich. And Lazarus didn't go to heaven because he was poor. The rich man went to hell because his riches had hold of him. And he wouldn't raise his eyes up. He had no compassion. He couldn't see beyond himself and his own feasting. The word for feasting there means exotic food. But you might have a Thanksgiving. I don't know now. We're so used to good meals everywhere. Thanksgiving meals don't mean that much. No. But it used to be a big feast with exotic game and things like that. Well, that man had that kind of stuff every day. And his fashions were the best. And here just 20, 20 feet away at his gate is Lazarus. And the man had no compassion on him. And Lazarus, all he could do is hold out for a few crumbs from the man's, you know, they didn't have napkins all the time. They used bread as a napkin. So the man would wipe his mouth from the bread and then throw it, throw it out. And that's what Lazarus depended upon. He didn't have a good life. And there are people in this world who love Jesus Christ who don't have a good life. And they're suffering horribly. And they're going to really be sad in this life but they have faith so Lazarus listen the Bible says the angels escorted his soul up to heaven the angels escorted him I love the song oh come angel bands I hear the rustling of the wings the wings of the angels oh come angel bands coming around me stands oh carry me away to my eternal home but the rich man, the man who had it all, lost it all, and the Bible just says he was buried. So what are we gonna do in heaven? Well, it's not gonna be a place for sermons, uh, and prayer will be a, a whole new dimension because we'll be right there with our Lord. We won't be tempted to sin. We'll want everything that the Lord has. And it's a place of reward. Now, I can't get this together in my mind. It's a place of reward. If you have in your pocket what belongs to God, then you're bringing stolen property in your house. Get rid of it. And show the compassion that it's supposed to do to funnel the kingdom of God. But beloved, when we get to heaven, there will be rewards. If you have given the woman who gave the, the widow's mite, she gave more than those who gave of the fat of their offering, of their bank accounts. She gave something sacrificially. And that's God loves that and he notices that. How how serious is this reward thing in heaven? You really think that some people will have it better than others? And the answer is the scripture says so. Jesus talked about the man who is faithful over five cities. And God said, you've been faithful over five cities. I will make you ruler over 10. Now, it's, you're not going to have cities. And the man who was faithful over 10, Jesus said, you'll have more. And the man who was not faithful, Jesus took from him even what he had. So I think there are no tears in heaven. But I think the capacity to enjoy heaven is based on what you do here. The Apostle Paul tells us, lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. We're thief and moth that you cannot come in and, and, and rust cannot corrupt and that's what you need to do I just saw in this neighborhood news where a lady had lost everything she had trusting some financial planner and then she got the word that she had nothing thief and moth and rust they come in and they corrupt but in heaven everything now how serious to what, to what degree Jesus said it like this I was laughed I tell you that whoever gives a cup of cold water in my name shall not go without its reward. Maybe this life, but also in heaven. 
So in heaven, there'll be degrees of reward. And that's uh, because we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, not for our salvation, but for our status in heaven. The gospel hymn writers, they used to write this, they wrote this song one time about the man who, who was a believer and went to heaven, but he didn't have much to offer God. And so he got rusty, a rusty old nail and secondhand wings. And you don't want that. You want to do all that God wants you to do. Heaven's a place, it's going to be a place called home. Hebrews 11 verse 16 says, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. The children of Israel, they were slaves, then they were wanderers and pilgrims in the, in the field, and God played tricks on them. And, and, and he, they would camp out, and then they said, no, we're moving, and they had to all pack it up and go again to show them the transitoriness of life. But they didn't have rest. Now God says, but they shall enter rest. And that's not just sleep, it's, it's everything happening. You'll be working in heaven, you'll be working. It's like the cogs of a wheel, and they all fit in and they all turn. And if you have the oil of the Holy Spirit, they turn and they're lubricated. And so you love what you're doing and you see the results, you see what your hands have done, you see what your prayers have prayed, and you see answers to prayers in heaven it'll be like that too we'll be working and we will love it we'll love what everybody's doing heaven's a place that we call home well how do you remove your doubt about heaven are you going that's the first thing are you going what are you trusting to get you in not your good works not the 30 seconds of your best moments sleeping the bible says this is what god told us first john 5 11 and 12 this is what God told us. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. But whoever does not have the son does not have life. And then again in Ephesians, the apostle writes, I mean that if you have been saved by grace through believing, you did not save yourselves. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own efforts, so you cannot brag about it. And that's the truth. What about our anxieties? Are you worried about whether you're getting into heaven? Oh, we have small troubles for a while, says the apostle, but they're helping us gain an eternal glory. That is much greater than the troubles. We set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. And let heaven fill your thoughts, he writes to the Colossians. Let heaven fill your thoughts. And spend your time worrying about things. Don't spend your time worrying about things down here. And finally, when we get to heaven, what will it be? Oh, world invisible, I see thee. Oh, world untouchable, we touch thee. And that's what we'll see when we get to heaven. And I'm going to close with this list from a Puritan writer. And it says this. When the soul first enters into heaven, this is what the soul says. Looking on Mount Memory, comparing heaven and earth fills the soul with unimaginable gratitude and it makes the soul exclaim, is this the inheritance that costs so much as the blood of Christ? No wonder, oh blessed Christ, is this the result of believing? Have the gales of grace blown me into such a harbor? Is this where Christ was so eager to bring me? Oh, praise the Lord. Is this the glory of which the scriptures spoke and of which ministers preach so much? I see the gospel is indeed really good news. Are all my troubles, Satan's temptations, the world scorns and jeers come to this? Oh, vile nature that resisted so much. Means we're so worried about dying. Oh, vile nature that resisted so much and so long such a blessing. Oh, you unworthy soul. Is this the place you come to so unwillingly? Was duty tiresome? Was the world too good to lose? Could you not leave all, deny all, and suffer anything for this? Were you loath to die to come to this? Oh, false heart. You had almost betrayed me to eternal flames and lost me to the glory. 
Are you not ashamed now, my soul, that you ever questioned that love which brought you here? Are you not sorry that you ever quenched his spirit's promptings or misinterpreted his providences or complained about the narrow road that brought you to such a destination? Now you are sufficiently convinced that your blessed Redeemer was saving you as well as when he crossed your desires as when he granted them. When he broke your heart as when he bound it up. No thanks to you, unworthy self, for this crown, but to God be the glory forever and ever. That's written by Richard Baxter. Baxter, last book yours. Well, beloved, those are the great things of heaven. And if you're going, it's a free gift. Christ says, come, come and go with me to the Father's house. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, wherever you are, I want to be. Forgive my sins. And he'll come in. He'll do that. He's done that for thousands of people every day. They are entering into the bliss of heaven. Let's pray. Almighty God, how poorly do we speak about that home, that real estate, but we know there's a book and our names are written in it by faith. And we know, Lord, that none of us deserve it. So we won't look around and see who's there. We'll just be thankful that we're there. And we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. May, may God give us grace as we labor in this world to live for him. And our closing hymn is, Heaven will surely be worth it all. It's here. struggling in the midst of the mystery of life be not afraid I am in the midst of the mystery and may God give you his perfect peace in Jesus Christ our Lord 
Amen. Um, Sing with me, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Awesome. 